Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series here at Brookdale Community College. I'm Suzanne Parker, part of the English faculty here at Brookdale and the director of the Visiting Writer Series. Today, I'm talking with poet Ross Gay, who is the author of the book Against Witch, which was published in 2006 by Coven Carey Press. Ross's work has also been featured in numerous leading national journals, including the Harvard Review, the Atlanta Review, the American Poetry Review. In addition to writing, Ross is currently on the faculty at Montclair State University, where I believe he's also the basketball coach. So welcome to the show, Ross. Hi. Hi. Um, I've got to ask first, how's your basketball season going? I'm, I'm not the basketball coach at Montclair State. But oh. I am uh, one of the basketball coaches at Union High School in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. so how's the Union High School season we, going? You know, we did all right. We took some, you know, we took some beatings, um, but we, uh, we improved. It was me and my buddies. Um, I'm the assistant coach, and mm -hmm. so we took over a team that's won like five games for the last three or four years or something like that. And we won eight games this year, so oh, we're getting congrats. better. Yeah, we're getting better. Oh, that's like good. A, yeah. That's good. Do you still have more of your season left? Nope, we're done. You're done? We're done. The whole state's wrapped up. I think they're... I think they're pretty much done the whole state. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, are people surprised you're a basketball coach? Like, I think of this idea of, like, the poet being yeah. very Keatsian and strolling across, you know, I don't know, the Moors or in New yeah. Jersey, that's probably like the Meadowlands yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. um, are people surprised? I think probably. You know, I was a, um, I was an athlete all through, you know, all of my life. I played football at, you know, Lafayette, you know, and um, there was this bit of a kind of joke because I'm a painter too, you know, and mm -hmm. um, so I'd be, you know, really I'd be kind of thinking about what poems I was working on or paintings. I was a little bit more into painting at the time while I was kind of uh, ramming my face into other people. And everyone knew that, you know, so they knew that after practice or whatever, I'd be going back to the studio and um, to make some work. That's, it surprised, yeah, it surprised a lot of people. But it was actually, you know, a lot of my buddies, they would like, I'd TA classes, painting classes, mm -hmm. so these big, gigantic dudes would come take the classes and stuff, you know. Knowing that you'd be yeah, TA. They, yeah, and they'd come in and get it, and like care, you know, really care about paintings. It's kind of beautiful. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you get the crossroad. Is there anything that's kind of in common between, you know, basketball and poetry that you find? Yeah. Other than maybe smashing up against a wall? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of them, you know. But there's this sort of um, attention to moments, you know, this... Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I teach my kids, actually, I taught, I taught my kids um, the Frost poem, um, or whatever, the road less traveled or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we spent like a half hour on, you know, all these kids, these, these uh, union kids, talking about this sort of, you know, because to me, the poem is about this speaker who's just sort of not quite clear. And there's a kind of amb heavy ambivalence in that poem about whether the thing that he's done is the right thing or it's not the right thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so in a way, writing poems, well, let me go to basketball first. In a way, writing or playing basketball is about all of these sort of decisions that you make, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a million decisions in a basketball game, you know, and, it's, and if you approach it that way, it's a sort of really meditative, um, it's this really meditative thing, you know. There's a million decisions, and you're sort of watching these things unfold all the time. You know, you're watching like hmm. um, this thing unfold. I've never thought of it as meditative. It seems very oh, absolutely, and absolutely, running. <laughs> yeah, absolutely meditative. You know, and um, if you're someone like me who's a decent basketball player, but if you're someone who's like an amazing basketball mm -hmm. player, and you talk to them when they're playing basketball and they're playing really well, they're sort of they're gone. You know, they're sort of in the zone. The, that's what they call it, you know, but yeah. it's this sort of different, very much a different space. And I think generally if I'm in a good place with writing poems or reading poems or doing whatever it is that makes poems happen, it's a similar space to, it's a similar space to where I'm playing my best basketball, you know, mm -hmm. because it's sort of like time. I have a very different relationship to time, mm -hmm. you know, I have a very different relationship to my body, mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't know that necessarily that my body disappears, but it sort of becomes the best body ever. You know, it's sort of just in my in my writing poems too. Yeah. It's just everything is can work uh, perfectly. Um, yeah. So I mean, there's a, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a million, and they're, they're both like things out of love. You know, poetry yeah. is something I do because I love it. Basketball is a thing that you know. I honestly, I tell kids like the reason I want to play basketball. Like if I have an itch to play and I'm thinking, ah, but you know, I'm kind of tired or this mm -hmm. or that. 
I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to do something beautiful or to be a part of something mm -hmm. beautiful. That's what I tell them. They laugh at me when I say that. You know, <laughs> you know, you know what they think of me. Um, Have you gotten any of your uh, union basketball players into poetry? I don't know if they were. Have you made the I, effort? You start practice with a, you know, a reading of the poem instead of the reading of the prayer or something. You know, <laughs> we don't do any prayers. <laughs> um, but at St. Anthony's High School, um, I, I coached there. Where there probably are um, prayers. Where there, where there are, in fact, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was an assistant JV coach up there. And we really would, you know, we'd do poems every, I'd write a poem for the mm -hmm. kids nearly every game, I think probably every other game. And they really cared, oh. you know. It was really sweet, you know. And I came back like three years later, and this kid, his name was Anthony. You know, the first thing he said was, "Your coach, you got you got any poems on you? Oh, you, know, cool. you have a poem, you know." So that was really sweet. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, I know I read somewhere in an interview that you had um, said that there's a part of poetry that is essential and indispensable to my life. Mm. And I'm wondering what part of poetry that was, um, or how so. Well. I think all I know is that I spend most of my life sort of puzzled um, and mm. perplexed, you know, in a pretty good way, I think. Yeah. Um, but there's something about um, there's something about the sort of activity of deeply, deeply meditating on on something, a question in my life, mm -hmm. and. Um, when I write a poem that I care about that ends up mattering to me, it is because I've meditated on something and I've sort of asked and asked and asked and asked and asked and asked and, asked and I learned something, mm -hmm. you know, and something sort of opened itself up to me in a way. Um, that's a sort of, um, I think that's a sort of way of existing in the world, you mm -hmm. know, that's, it feels like a, an honest way of existing in the world. It feels like a very contrary way of existing in the world, in mm -hmm. fact, in, in our world. You know. Is honesty important in your work? I mean, honesty and emotional honesty, yeah. you know. I don't care about facts and poems too much. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that's general. Generally, I don't think people care too much about facts and poems. Uh, readers might care. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> The whole, is it true? Did yeah, it really happen? Yeah, that thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of... Uh, a kind of honesty. I mean, I don't know what that is. Like, it, you know, everything changes with it. You know, if anything mm -hmm. happens over a duration of time, it changes. Like, so the, the so-called honesty of the thing will change from, you mm -hmm. know, second to second. But if the impulse is to, in fact, sort of uncover something, to me, that's, that's where the honesty lies more, I think, in its impulse. I mean, the final mm -hmm. result, honesty is sort of subjective, I guess. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think in, in the impulse, yeah. So that's something that's indispensable to me, you know. Yeah. That's something that's indispensable to me. What I love about your work, and I think um, Tom Lux had talked about the enormous energy in your poems. Mm -hmm. And they are, these are just poems that just, I mean, really jump off the page. Mm -hmm. And at great speed, you really move really quickly yeah. in your poems. Yeah. And, and, and you have these wonderful associations and metaphors and leaps that I think, oh, I wish I'd done that. Yeah. You know, that's just wonderful. Um, it's interesting to me that you say, you know, you question and, and you push and you discover and you discover. Um, because it seems to me your poems end up where, of course, of course it would end up there. Mm -hmm. But at the start of the poem, I never necessarily thought I was getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know where you're headed when you write? Not a drop. No. <laughs> Not a drop. No. So actually what you just said is like, that's, that's a pretty good affirmation <laughs> for me, you know. <laughs> No, and almost any time that I write a poem and I, and I know the ending, mm -hmm. it's going to be a bad poem. Almost, almost, almost any time, you know? But if I write a poem that comes, yeah. like I said, out of a question, and I don't know, like, what's the question? What's the answer to the question? Yeah. You know, then, then the poem, it has a possibility of being something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I deeply feel that, and I deeply feel that the sort of same experience of discovery that I can have... Um, in, in coming to and kind of mm -hmm. knowledge what you're talking about that, that you're sort of traveling through the poem and then you something occurs in mm -hmm. the poem that makes you say oh of course yeah of course this is the thing um, I have that experience when I'm writing it you know mm -hmm. and I deeply feel that if I'm having that experience it's possible yeah. for you to have it and I also deeply feel that if I'm not having that experience probably you're not gonna have, have it either yeah, yeah. can I you think, think of any poets writing today who who you feel really 
are able to move the poem like that? Patrick Rosell is yeah. one. Um, uh, a new poet, new. Um, Aracelis Girmay, she's, uh, her book's coming out with uh, Curbstone Press mm -hmm. in June. And, I mean, unbelievable. Really? Um, a poet named Steve Scafidi, mm -hmm. who's down in uh, West Virginia. He has two books. LSU does his books. Like, unbelievable poems, mm. you know? Those are three people who, whose work... Just has that sort of forward momentum. Momentum and, and where, you, at the end of the poem, again, like, you feel like this is sort of an absolute... This is an absolute unveiling of something mm. that you knew somewhere, but you didn't know you knew. Yeah. That sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love that in, in, your, in your work. Thank you. I was just wondering what your writing process is. Um, if you don't know where your poems are going to end up, do you at least know that at like you know 5 a.m. every morning I will be sitting at my desk for 3.5 hours? <laughs> are you are you one of those people who has a real rigorous? No. No. <laughs> no, not at all. I you know I I'm always writing notes to poems. Mm -hmm. um, always, always, always. But I'm not. I'm just. I don't know. Maybe I will be that way one day mm -hmm. when I grow up. But. For the time being, it just doesn't, that kind of thing doesn't work for me. I write in transit a lot because I am in transit a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I drive, I have to drive a lot right now and um, traveling a lot, like flying a lot and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I write a lot in those sort of, I guess, liminal spaces, actually, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so when I'm driving, I'm taking notes. You'd uh -huh. be happy to know. <laughs> um, but I don't, yeah, I don't have anything. But, um, in terms of that sort of discovery process mm -hmm. when you, you know, I, I will write things that I think may have to pertain to a certain poem that I'm working on, little, uh -huh. little ideas that end up, you know, little notes toward the poem. And there are probably, you know, a poem that's a page long. There are probably 30 or 40 of those little things oh, that, wow. that end up just being sort of like, is this the thing? Is this, is this the movement? Questions. Is this the movement? Yeah, questions about things. it or a line that may fit or may not. Yeah. Um, and that can go on for a long time. Well, that really is. I mean, that's the process, just adding yeah. and adding on yeah. to it. It seems it's interesting. I think Lucille Clifton once had said, um, you know, someone asked her about the short poems she writes. And yeah. I think she responded saying, well, when you have, when you're raising grandkids and you only have a little bit of time during yeah. naps, you write short poems. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think Sonia Sanchez may have said a similar thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're going to take a short break. And then we're going to come back. We're talking with Ross Gay, who's the author of the poetry collection Against Which. Please do come back after break. Horseradish. Is that for horses? Banana. 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 Here comes the rain. We need a hat. <laughs> and why do we need a hat? Hmm? To say joy. That's right. When you talk with your child, you build vocabulary, and learning starts long before school does. For more tips, go to bornlearning.org. For more information about resources in the tri-state area, call 800-216-0577. It may seem intimidating, but really, it's one of the easiest things you can ever do. I've been practicing. Good. You're going to need it. America's youth. Be a friend. Be a mentor. Just be there. Go to bigbrothersbigsisters.org. You're so lost. No, I am not, man. Dude, I dropped my phone. Oh, no, the road! Guys. Whoa! Okay. How would you like to save your life from an ugly, reckless driving death? Don't answer yet! There's more! Act now by slowing down, and we'll guarantee you complete satisfaction! That's awesome! In the real world, there is no spokesperson to prevent reckless driving. There's only you. Speak up. Whoa, Andy, slow down! Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writers Series. I'm Suzanne Parker, and I'm here today talking with the poet Ross Gay, who is the poet... Uh, the author of the collection, Against Which. Um, welcome back to the show. Um, I was wondering, Ross, could you possibly describe this collection of poems for us? Oh, gosh. Tough question, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, In ten words or less. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I have like a primary sort of... Um, question or obsession in, in the book, and it seems to be mostly about issues of justice, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 
Mostly. I mean, not entirely, but I mean, if there's an overriding theme, it seems like I'm most concerned with, you know, um, ways that people are or are not treated the way that I probably imagine that they ought to be in the world. I think that's mm -hmm. basically it. I mean, there are also like these sort of plain love poems and plain like sort of family poems that don't go into that, mm -hmm. I think. But I think the overarching thing is something about justice. I could definitely see that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, this is your first book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were writing these poems, were you writing towards that theme, towards the idea of, of the book? No. And that's, I think that's the thing with a first book of poems that's different than like, um, for me anyway, mm -hmm. for, it's different than like the, the new book that I'm working on. I know with this new book sort of approximately what I'm writing about. With this first book, it's basically the, the best 42 or whatever poems that I had up till the time I decided, well, you know, I think I have a book. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to find the kind of the arc and the what mm -hmm. the book was about as a, as a unit after it was sort of assembled, you know, and I needed help, you know, I yeah. needed, needed help from people to do that. Did you, once you saw that, you know, the overarching theme was justice, did you then write some poems for that theme with the idea of I need to, I need to add a couple more, really make this clear type thing? No, no, no. no. I don't think I did. I think, um, I mean, I think the, the other poems that were, after I realized that, mm -hmm. I think the poems that were written um, end up being sort of love poems for my dad, you know. And mm -hmm. So they're not actually, they're sort of different poems. Well, I, there is that poem, How to Fall in Love with Your P Father, yeah. which is just, just yeah, a gorgeous poem. Thank you. Um, would you read it, actually? Yeah, sure, would you sure. mind? Yeah. Can I use that? Yes, you can. How to Fall in Love with Your Father. Put your hands beneath his armpits, bend your knees, wait for the clasp of his thinning arms. The best lock, cheek to cheek. Move slow. Do not, right now, recall the shapes he traced yesterday on your back, moments before being wheeled to surgery. Do not pretend the anxious calligraphy of touch was signed beyond some unspeakable animal stammer. Do not go back further into the landscape of silence you both tended with body and breath until it nearly obscured all but the genetic gravity between you. And do not imagine wind now blowing that landscape into a river which spills into a sea because it doesn't. That's not this love poem. In this love poem, the son trains himself on the task at hand, which is simple, which is finally the only task he has ever had which is lifting the father to his feet. Hmm. That is just gorgeous. Thanks. Um, thank you for reading it. It's been my pleasure. Well, I actually, I love that poem partly too, because it seems to me that the speaker is finding, finding himself in a place he wasn't necessarily expecting to be, or in, in the relationship, the, the way he had to deal with the world was changing and evolving in this difficult fashion. Yeah. Um, and I was actually just kind of wondering, did you expect to write this poem? Were there poems you wrote that you hadn't expected to write, but that just sort of happened? Um, that's a good question. I mean, on one hand, that's very much my process, right? Yeah. The poems that I don't expect to write are the poems mm -hmm. that I end up writing. Um, but then there's also this sort of practical thing about, you know, I didn't, A, I didn't know that my dad was going to get sick mm -hmm. and die. Um, a, and B, I didn't know necessarily the sort of emotions that that would occasion, mm -hmm. you know, so I didn't, I had no idea, you know, I had no idea what I felt, I still don't, but you know, I had, I had no idea what I felt, so um, dealing with someone who you have a very complicated relationship with and sort of watching them, um, you know, turn into what, you know, they're going to turn into, mm -hmm. you know, made something in me, I mean, it changed something in me, and it certainly, um, it was, you know, I'm vastly different than, than who I was, though I don't know exactly what that is, so basically what I'm saying is that, yeah, I don't, you know, there's definitely poems in there I had no idea yeah. were going to be in there. Well, see, I mean, there's some poems, I think, that are so, there's, they have, have such a great humanity in them, and, a, and an attempt at, at empathy, mm -hmm. um, and, Yet they're, they're full of grief and right. a sense of, of loss, it seems, and, and anger at yeah. this great anger in this book. Right. Um, I don't know if you can say that. Great anger. It's great anger. <laughs> it's out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous anger. Yeah. Um, 
but it, it, the reality, the things you kind of smack up into in this world. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, the poems, particularly with your father, that are so full of, of, of pain and grief. I mean, were these, obviously they were hard poems to write, but were they something you found you had to distance yourself from before you could sort of, in a way, deal with the material, I guess? Yeah. Um, I think probably in some way, but I, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I don't, it's, it's a good question and it's something that I haven't really thought about. Like, I don't exactly know how far, you know, the way that we mourn and grieve, like, I think mm. probably part of some people's process of um, grieving is like already assuming the person's dead, you know, mm. I feel like. I mean, and poets, first of all, you know, all we want to do is write elegies. So it's like, <laughs> you know, you know, Jerry Stern always makes this joke like that. We're, you know, we just can't wait for another poet to die. So we can. <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how much distance. But you know, actually, mm -hmm. a few of those poems are. Um, they're. They're written out of sort of extreme confusion and sadness mm -hmm. and um, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that they were written close to you know in the midst of that you know in, the, in yeah. the midst of illness and death and and um, and you know sort of trying to like you know figure that out yeah. because that's sort of the thing that I do if I don't sort of write about it you know writing about it is my thinking about it you mm -hmm. know so they turned into they turned into something, but they very much feel like questions, and they they definitely don't speak to me about what I knew. They mm -hmm. speak to me about sort of what I was feeling and at the time. Yeah, how sort yeah. of dislodged I was probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, on a on a hap a perkier note. Yeah. Um, there's great humor in these poems too, yeah. like an irreverence. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of um, is it Song of the Pig who kissed the author and gave him worms at yeah, age three yeah. or something like yeah, that, which is in the voice of the pig, yeah. which is just fabulous. This yeah. wonderful kind of turning around. Yeah. And um, the man shoots self with crossbow yeah. and you fails. You have a funny sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> you have a funny sense of humor. Oh, those weren't meant to be yeah, funny? <laughs> I mean, now they're funny. Of course they're funny, but the one, like the pig, it's about the pig. He gets, you know, he's saying like, I want you dead. You know, oh, that's, that's what he's true. saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but yeah, you're right, though. You're right. <laughs> well, the thing is, it seems like you take the, there in the, some of the poems. There are these sort of the the tougher, darker side of life, yeah. and and you approach it from a position of, of humor or yeah. kind of a, approach it sideways yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, you didn't start the poem saying, "Oh, whoa, I <laughs> right, am right, bacon right, on right. the plate." Right, right, you right. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, is that something you you appreciate in other poets? Or in your own writing that you yeah. sort of try for? Yeah, I do. Take a fresh angle? I do, I do. Yeah. You know, I I think being funny is funny. Um, <laughs> but I also, you know, but funny, um, you know, for instance, like Richard yeah. Pryor is someone who I love. Mm -hmm. I adore Richard Pryor's work. You know, I think he's a genius. I think some of the, you know, I mean, some of the best sort of, you know, cultural critique that mm -hmm. I've ever seen or read or anything is Richard Pryor. And his jokes are not just funny at all. His mm -hmm. jokes are like awful, you know, mm -hmm. every, almost, you know, it's very rare that you watch, uh, for me, you know, watching like tapes or mm -hmm. DVDs of Richard Pryor, it's very rare that he's saying something that's, that's just funny. It's almost always funny and sort yeah. of awful. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's a model, you know. I've really studied Richard Pryor, you know, and I don't know um, that maybe maybe in a way that's a model i don't i don't get a kick out of uh things that are clever or sort of funny mm -hmm. for, generally funny for funniness sake i mean i don't i don't <laughs> i get kind of bored for that you know yeah. i always feel like time's running out to tell something well i think that the humor in this is always working towards or against something else actually yeah. there is that tension you know yeah. you always talk about tension in yeah. poems yeah and there is definitely that yeah. you said that you're working on a new book yeah um, and that this one does have you, you're working yeah, towards something? I mean, Do you want I mean, to talk about that? Well, I mean, it's the sort of <laughs> the same <laughs> thing. All I write about is sort of these same issues of justice stuff. Um, but in a way, I mean, this, this new thing is about um, how, how, you know, it's about, you know, Auden Lord has this, this moment in uh, an essay, Audre Lorde, 
if people don't know, is a, an important, you know, black feminist scholar, poet, mm. um, theorist in a way, um, fiction writer. Who if, <laughs> she's done it all. She's done it all, <laughs> yeah. Who died, um, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe. And she has a, an essay called Poetry is Not a Luxury. And in, mm. in the essay at some point, she talks about something like we need to give our children sustenance so that they don't have to dream the same dreams we've dreamt. Mm. That's an uh, approximate, um, which to me is just an enormous, enormous, enormous idea. You know, mm -hmm. what does it mean to sort of be a participant in that? And like, you know, because I'm a child too. You know, I'm someone's child. You know, and what does it mean for me to be sort of invested in dreaming something that no one else has dreamt? Because you know what, most of the dreams have been wrong so far. Mm. Most I don't yeah. want these dreams. Yeah. Um, and I and the dreams that I have are messed up. I want to use expletives are messed up for our, you know, for my kids, yeah. you know, and so basically this, that's, you know what, that ends up being the sort of informing, you know, overlaying kind of thrust to the book, like how is it that a speaker in a book, I think in the book that there's going to be this kind of development toward one thing, mm -hmm. which is, which is the dream that we have now, which is the wrong dream and toward another thing, which might which might be another dream. Well, that yeah. actually seems like a wonderful note to, to finish on. So toward another dream and another yeah. book. Thank so you. again, I want to thank Ross Gay, uh, poet and author of the uh, collection of poems called Against Witch for being on our show. And thank you for listening to the Brickdale Visiting Writer Series. Have a good night. Today, my heart is so goddamn fat with grief that I've begun hauling it in a wheelbarrow. No. It's an anvil dragging from my neck as I swim through choppy waters swollen with the putrid corpses of hippos, which means lurking somewhere below in the, is the hungry snout of a croc waiting to spin me into an oblivion worse than this run-on simile. Which means only to say, I'm sad. And everyone knows what that means. And in my sadness, I'll walk to a cafe and not see light in the trees nor finger the bills in my pocket as I see and pass the boarded houses on the block. No, I will be slogging through the obscure country of my sadness in all its monotone flourish. So imagine my surprise when my self-absorption...